tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Mood. You know what would hit the spot right about now? A really chill, mellow THC high. I'll wait until the episode is over, though. Don't worry. Otherwise, we'll be sitting here all night. <laughs> but once the mic goes off, it's just me and my new friends at Mood. See, Mood is the finest purveyor of federally legal THC. Each one of their fine products is designed to give you just the mood you're after. Chill, creative, energized, euphoric, or even just to help you get some sleep. Either way, the guessing game is over. Whatever mood you're after, it's time to get in it. Try Mood's new THCA flower today. For a limited time only, you get 20% off your first order and a free THCA pre-roll. Just go to hellomood.com and use promo code CHILLING. That's hellomood.com code CHILLING for 20% off your order and a free THCA pre-roll. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about twisted trends and exclusive enticements. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Marta Abromitite and Warren Benedetto, our voice talents Olivia Steele, Justine Anastasia, Danielle Hewitt, Michelle Kane, Steve Gray, and Rissa Montanez. Now... Get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Marta Abramitite and is performed by Olivia Steele. In it... We meet a woman desperately trying to find herself. But was she ever really lost to begin with? Now, without further ado, I present to you... Pokemon Go! I've been obsessed with playing Pokemon Go ever since its release in 2016. I've loved Pokemon since I was a kid, though playing the original games and watching the cartoons. It was just something that I loved doing along with my boyfriend, Daniel. He and I would spend all our free time walking in parks around our local area. It might seem sad and pathetic to some of you, and I guess it is, but it was our thing, something we bonded over and something that brought us closer together. If I knew what would happen years down the line, I'd have deleted the app long ago, but I didn't. 
you only live to regret shit after it has already happened. Life's a bastard like that sometimes. After a while, the game slowly lost its allure, and I stopped playing for a while. Both of us did. I think life just got in the way, you know? New jobs, new responsibilities, all that boring jazz. We didn't pick the game back up until quite recently, a few months ago now, although it seems like everything happened only yesterday. It all seems so very raw still, like a wound that hasn't quite healed and has become infected, necrotic. It's been slowly eating away at me, but the gangrenous wound is on the inside and not something that I can just chuck a plaster on. It's etched so deep into my soul that I don't know that I'll ever truly get over it. Maybe talking about it will help. Daniel and I were in bed one day, so long ago now, watching some nondescript TV show that I can't even remember the name of. Both of us were just unwinding on our phones, as most couples do in the 21st century, I guess. I was swiping through my apps when I saw I had a notification on the Pokemon Go app. Absent-mindedly, I clicked it, realizing how long it's been since I played. When it eventually loaded, I was greeted by the familiar bright colors of the game itself. My character stood amongst the cartoon streets, surrounded by Pokestops and gyms. We always got lucky with our location, as it was a hotspot for Pokemon. I had not logged in for more than five minutes before a wild Charmander appeared. I clicked on him, feeling that same familiar excitement that I used to get when playing the game. When he loaded, I noticed something. There was something different about this Charmander. Usually, he was a bright red and vibrant, a normal cartoon animal, really, if you can call them animals. Anyway, this one looked... off. He still had the same vibrant colors, but they seemed darker somewhat, more sinister. The orange was mixed with a deep red that appeared almost bloodstained, and he was completely adorned in stitches as if someone carved him open and then stitched him back up crudely with a blunt needle. Instead of the usual ocean blue, his eyes were as black as the night. It kind of creeped me out, so I showed it to Daniel. Must be a new update, he said, not even glancing at my phone. It doesn't look right, though. Kind of creepy, I said. Daniel didn't say anything in response. I sighed, still looking at the Pokemon. I closed the app, but before I did, I could have sworn that the Charmander smiled at me. A few inconsequential days passed, and I'd almost forgotten my encounter with the bizarre Charmander. But one night, a few days later, everything in my life changed. I was laying in bed when I suddenly got an overwhelming desire to open the app. I can't explain why, I really just wanted to play the game. Something inside me was willing me to play the game. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the longing for that old life. The life where Daniel and I didn't have any cares or worries. I loaded it up and waited patiently for any kind of Pokemon to appear. There was nothing. I waited and waited... Minutes turned into an hour, and that hour turned into two. Eventually, something spawned. A Cubone. The lonely Pokemon stared at me, holding his signature fragment of cartilage. Nothing seemed untoward or different about him at first glance, but upon closer inspection, I noticed that the bone in his hand was stained with blood. I frowned, but before I could do anything... A notification appeared at the top of the page. Try this with AR, a never-before-seen experience. I clicked on it, and it immediately showed me my own bedroom. Cubone stood on the floor between my TV and my bed, but he seemed closer this time, like he'd moved a few inches toward me. I decided to play along and catch him. Maybe this was just some new, creepy-as-fuck update that they were trying out. I clicked into my inventory and noticed that all the Pokeballs looked different, too. They were different shapes than the usual oval. They were square with jagged edges. 
weird. I picked one, and with a somewhat shaky finger, I spun the ball and threw it at the cue bone. The ball quivered and shook, but the cue bone stayed in. Afterwards, I stared at the screen. The augmented reality was still active, but there were no Pokemon to catch. However, I thought I could see something in the open doorway of my room. I I thought I saw something that was in the shape of a face. Long, dark, and scraggly hair obscured the features, but I could see two pairs of glowing eyes. They burned bright like the morning sun. What the fuck was this? I was certain this wasn't part of the experience, and it freaked me out. I tried to zoom in on the face, but couldn't. Looking at it filled me with such dread. I wanted to show it to Daniel, though, so I took a screenshot. I turned to face him, but he was already asleep. With a disquieted sigh, I quit the app and tried going to sleep. I should have left it well enough alone. The next morning, I tried to explain what I saw to Daniel, who, as per his usual, reacted with indifference. It annoyed me, so I tried to show him the screenshot, but when I opened my photo album, there was nothing there. You probably dreamt it, he said, not taking his eyes off his phone to even look at me. Fuck you, Daniel, I know what I saw, I said and stormed out of the room. I was incredibly shaken. Was it possible that I could have dreamt it? I couldn't get that haunting face out of my mind, though. Those eyes burned deep into my soul. It was real. I went back to our bedroom, and I launched the app once more. I was greeted with a familiar loading screen, and when the game appeared, instead of the cartoon world, I saw my own bedroom again. I tried to quit the augmented reality, but I couldn't. They say curiosity kills the cat, and now I believe in that phrase more than anything. I looked around the room. Everything looked normal and unchanged, on the surface at least. I continued looking around the room, hoping to see something. I don't know why I wanted to see something, I just did. Then suddenly, everything changed. My room was still my room, but it looked different. Everything was so dark, like the sun had been swallowed. The floor was stained, a mixture of blood and dirt. Everything looked old. So old. My heart leaped into my mouth when I saw two figures standing in the doorway. They were clad in ripped, threadbare rags and covered in blood. It dripped from every orifice onto the floor. I knew who they were. It was Daniel and me. I whimpered, utterly frozen by fear. I tried to call out Daniel's name, but all I could muster was a small, faint wail. That was when they both turned to look at me. I lowered the phone, and when I did, I saw that everything looked normal. I could see Daniel's silhouette on the laminated flooring. I glanced back at my phone. The two figures were now facing me and our eyes met. Their faces were bloated and bulbous. Neither of them had a mouth, only two bright glowing eyes. I heard someone calling my name. I knew that it was coming from my phone, but the faint robotic sound echoed around my room and in my head. The voice sounded scratchy, guttural, like someone had been scraping razor blades on their vocal cords. Hesitantly, I picked up the phone, and I saw her face. The face that was supposed to be mine. The blank space where her mouth was supposed to be suddenly ripped open. Blood, teeth, and viscera splattered across the screen. The now gaping hole oozed crimson, like a sudden dam had broken inside. She was moving her mouth as if she wanted to say something, but the blood just wouldn't relent. It kept flowing. I dropped my phone when I saw my own hands. They were covered in fresh, glistening blood. I finally managed to scream. I screamed for Daniel, but he didn't come. I rushed out to the kitchen, and what I saw then, I will never forget. 
I saw Daniel's phone on the floor with his body halfway submerged inside the screen. I couldn't make myself move. I tried so hard, I screamed at my muscles to move, but they wouldn't. I stood helplessly as that thing that was meant to be Daniel pulled my Daniel inside that blood-filled, sunless world. By the time I was able to move, the deed had been done. Daniel was gone. I ran to his phone, but it was blank. Broken. I turned to face my own room, and I looked at the phone that lay on my bed. Before I went back in, I retrieved the sharpest knife that I could find in my kitchen. I stabbed the phone incessantly until the screen was nothing but shattered glass. I never saw Daniel again. He was declared missing. I was a suspect for a while, naturally, but eventually I was cleared due to a lack of evidence. I moved away, and I tried to never look back. Tried so hard, but it has proven to be difficult. I dream about the day Daniel was sucked into that awful, horrendous world, and I dream about that other me, the one with the never-ending bleeding mouth and glowing eyes. I haven't played Pokemon Go since. The phone I have now doesn't support the app, and I am thankful for that because some days I yearn to see what I saw as much as it terrified me. I desperately wanted to find Daniel, though. I wanted to save him. I haven't been the same since, and I know that I can't be saved. But please, I beg you, don't play Pokemon Go. You don't know what you'll find. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Mood. Almost time to get in the mood, folks. The second I get out that evil little laugh at the end, I'll be pulling out my Hero Dose Wedding Cake Vape Pen. Are you with me? If you're not, I suggest a post-haste visit to our good friends at Mood. See, Mood is best known for their amazing array of federally legal THC products. Everything from vapes to edibles to drops to hash. Not to mention their new and incredibly potent THCA flower. Their most powerful breakthrough in the world of legal cannabis. The greatest thing about Mood is that their in-house experts tailor and test each product for just the feeling you're after. They've got 10 high inducing strains and they mix and match them for whatever mood you're after. Say you're looking to get some sleep, you can try their Sleepy Time Delta 9 gummies. Say you're looking to get energized, try their Hero Dose Delta 8 Blueberry Diesel Vape. They've also got powerful CBD tinctures when you just need a little relief. Either way, they're all clearly labeled for exactly what you're after. They've even got the exact amounts and THC, CBD, and even HHC listed. With Mood, the guessing games are over. Me? I like to mellow out after a long day. So I lean toward Mood's relieved, chill, and sleep varieties, a toot on the Hero Dose Wedding Cake Vape Pen, or a spark of the Slurricane THC flower, and I am golden. I could be convinced to smoke a little dab batter wax too, you understand, or some social nano THC syrup when the mood arises. They've got something for every mood, literally, and whether you're a beginner or a veteran, you can be sure they've got something for you. Try Mood's new THCA flower today. For a limited time only, get 20% off your first order and a free THCA pre-roll. Just go to hellomood.com and use promo code CHILLING. That's hellomood.com, code CHILLING for 20% off your order and a free THCA pre-roll. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors.
I hope you enjoyed Pokemon Go, as written by Marta Abramitite and performed by Olivia Steele. This terrifying tale was provided to us by our friends at Velox. Find out more about this and many other tales at www.veloxbooks.com. Olivia Steele is a voice actress who loves the spooky side of things. Her talent varies between gameplay, live stream archives, singing, and other voiceover related things. Our second tale of the evening is written by Warren Benedetto and performed by Justine Anastasia, Danielle Hewitt, Michelle Kane, Olivia Steele, Steve Gray, and Rissa Montanez. In it, we meet Jacqueline and Jody, a pair of twins separated in one of the worst ways possible. Now, without further ado, I present to you a perfect fit. My high heels clicked on the marble floor as I entered Reposo, an exclusive Italian eatery in the heart of Manhattan's Upper East Side. Bright sunlight streamed through the floor-to-ceiling windows, whose climbing vines dappled the restaurant's interior with irregular shadows. I could hear the cheery bounce of Dean Martin's Luna Mezza Mare, the music faintly audible under the electric buzz of conversation and the clinking of silverware on fine china. I stopped at the entrance to the main dining room, scanning the crowded restaurant for the group I was there to meet. A trio of old college friends from Wellesley. I'd known them for decades, and had hated them for just as long. I could never say that, of course. That wouldn't be polite. And if I was anything, I was polite. I was raised in a polite society, after all. That upper crust of Manhattan glitterati that values appearances above all else. The more you hate someone, the harder you smile. My mother taught me that. The flesh on her face lifted cheeks drawn up into a joker's grin. Her white veneers gleaming between her overlined lips. How dare you? A woman's voice echoed behind me, breaking me from my memory. The woman's tone was acerbic, but the voice was familiar. I sucked in to flatten my stomach then turned to see a statuesque brunette in a tight-fitting teal mini-dress scowling at me. It was Poppy, short for Penelope, my freshman year roommate at Wellesley. We had been acquaintances before college, both of us attending some of the same yawn-inducing social functions to which our parents dragged us, but we didn't become close until we were assigned to live together. Within weeks, we were sharing clothes, shoes, eating disorders, basically everything. How dare you show up here looking absolutely fucking gorgeous she pulled me close for a pair of air kisses first on one cheek then the other she smelled like Le Lame Sacré de Teb, the same six thousand dollar perfume she had been wearing since her wedding to the investment banker with the questionable relationship with the sec i stepped back to admire poppy's frame noting the slight swelling of her hips and the fine vertical lines above her upper lip. The ghost of a gray hair peeked out from the bang she had added to hide her creased forehead. Poppy! Look at you! How are you so perfect? Poppy examined her finely manicured nails and sighed with faux nonchalance. Just lucky, I guess. She smiled and extended a hand to me. Come on, we're in the back. Poppy took my hand and led me through the restaurant toward a semi-circular booth where two other women, Lisa and Jennifer, sat sipping pink martinis. Lisa's short blonde bob framed a round face, artificially smoothed with Botox and fillers. God, she looks like crap, I thought. Her eyebrows were too thick, and a thin dusting of peach fuzz was visible on her powdered cheeks. The woman desperately needed a new esthetician, and a new personal trainer too from the looks of it. She must have gained 15 pounds in the last year. Jennifer, in contrast, was a natural beauty, with long copper hair and fair skin. Unlike Poppy and Lisa, her face was devoid of crow's feet and laugh lines, or any apparent attempts to medically conceal them. I felt a ball of burning jealousy ignite in my belly. Of course she looked amazing. She always had. She seemed to be impervious to the ravages of time. 
No hair dye, no injections, no peels. She appeared perfectly filtered, photoshopped, and facetuned, but in real life. Lisa's jaw dropped when she saw me approaching. She grabbed Jennifer's arm dramatically. Look at this goddess. She exclaimed in an awed whisper. Jennifer popped a cube of cheese into her mouth, speaking as she chewed. There should be a law against looking that good. Seriously, it's not even fair. You'd be on death row if there was. I slid into the booth next to Jennifer and air kissed her cheek. Hello, lovelies. What are we drinking? Oh my god, you have to try this. Lisa passed me a martini the color of pink cotton candy. Three olive-sized balls of watermelon speared with a clear glass rod were submerged in the drink. A glistening white crust lined the rim. I lifted the melon balls out of the glass and sipped the martini. Sugar clung to my lips. I licked it off, then moaned with pleasure. Mmm, so good. What is it? It's called a Wondermelon Martini. Poppy slipped into the other side of the booth next to Lisa. Giorgio makes them special, just for us. She wiggled her fingers at the bartender, a handsome Italian with curly black hair and just the right amount of stubble. He gave her a bashful smile that crinkled the corners of his eyes. If I wasn't married... Poppy sighed wistfully. Hmm, I'd eat him alive. Well, he is delicious. Jennifer quickly popped another piece of cheese in her mouth as she tried to suppress a knowing smile. Poppy gaped at her. Wait, did you? Jennifer shrugged coyly, then dabbed the corners of her mouth with a cloth napkin. Maybe. Oh my god, you little slut! I guess that's one of the benefits of having a dead husband, I chimed in with a smile. Along with the money, of course. All of the sounds in the restaurant seemed to cut out at the same time. An awkward silence descended over the table like a thundercloud. Jennifer's eyes welled with tears. Poppy glanced at Lisa with an exaggerated grimace. Lisa responded by mouthing a silent, ouch. My stomach plummeted. It had been a few months since Jennifer's husband dropped dead while running on the treadmill in their penthouse. He was a serial philanderer, most recently seen dining with a woman half Jennifer's age at Le Cuckoo. Jennifer had been teasing the idea of getting a divorce for years, but she feared the prenup would leave her with too little money to sustain her fabulous lifestyle. Luckily, God stepped in and declared the contract null and void. All of her dead husband's cash and assets were left to her. I assumed she was glad to be rid of the guy, but judging by her reaction to my comment, she wasn't quite ready to joke about it yet. Stammering, I tried to backpedal. Oh, oh no, Jennifer, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean... No, it's okay. Jennifer forced a smile. It's fine. She raised her eyebrows and gave a short, joyless chuckle as she mindlessly jabbed a toothpick into a square of cheese. You're not wrong. Still, I shouldn't have said it. It's fine, Jennifer insisted. She speared the cheese with one last stab, then flicked the toothpick onto the tablecloth. I'm over it. Anyway, Lisa tried to change the subject. What I want to know is how you look ten years younger since the last time we saw you. Jennifer's demeanor brightened. Do I? At least ten years. What's your secret? Jennifer extended her arm toward Poppy. Feel? Poppy ran her fingers along the flawless white skin of Jennifer's forearm. (laughs) Nice, right? Is it creme de la mer? It has to be. Jennifer chuckled. (laughs) Uh, Not quite. So? Lisa gave Jennifer a nudge with her elbow. What is it? Jennifer sat up straight and peered around the restaurant, surveying the nearby tables for eavesdroppers. The other diners seemed to be fully immersed in their own conversations. Satisfied that nobody was listening, she leaned forward and lowered her voice to a whisper. I can trust you girls, right? 
We all nodded and huddled in closer to hear what Jennifer was about to say. Okay, have you heard of Second Skin? I'd never heard of it, but I didn't want to seem out of the loop. Of course, it's fabulous. Jennifer narrowed her eyes. You've been there? Well, no, but... I didn't think so. Her dismissive tone made me feel three sizes smaller, and not in a good way. I took a delicate sip of my martini, quelling the urge to shatter the glass on the table and shove the jagged stem into Jennifer's eye. Wait, Second Skin is a place? Lisa seemed confused. I thought it was a cream. It's not just a place. It's an experience. By far the most luxurious spa I've ever been to. It's literally heaven. Poppy looked intrigued. Better than the Four Seasons? It makes the Four Seasons look like a porta potty. Then how come I've never heard of it? Lisa cocked a skeptical eyebrow as far as the Botox would allow. And why are we talking about it like we're doing espionage? That's the thing. Jennifer lowered her voice even more. It doesn't exist. It doesn't have a sign. It doesn't have a storefront. It doesn't even have an address. It's completely underground. Like when we used to go to those raves back in the day. They even made me sign an NDA. As all the best raves do. Still silently fuming, I crossed my arms over my chest. How did you hear about it, if it's so secret? Jennifer opened her mouth to speak, then closed it. After a moment of hesitation, she answered. I, I can't say. So? Poppy took a sip of her drink, then licked the sugar off her lips. When do we go? You can't. Poppy pouted with disappointment. Why not? Yeah. What are they gonna do? Kill you? I I'm sorry, I just, uh... Jennifer cleared her throat. I just don't want to take any chances. Wow. Okay. Lisa sounded mildly annoyed. So why did you even tell us about it? Oh, well, you asked! Well, technically, I asked, but it's fine. Poppy said with a shrug. We'll just keep slumming it up at the Four Seasons. Right, ladies? To slumming it. Lisa raised her glass in a toast. Poppy and Jennifer laughed. After a moment, I forced myself to join in, giggling brightly like the others. I clinked my glass with theirs. To slumming it. Thanks, girls. I waved to Poppy and Lisa as they climbed into a black town car outside Reposo. It was fun. Jennifer stood beside me. She finished sending a text message, then dropped her phone into her oversized Birkin bag. Ciao! She blew a kiss and waved as the car pulled away from the curb. Once it was gone, she turned to me. You walking? I looked up at the cloudless sky. Might as well. I smoothed my hands over my thighs and around my bottom. I could use the exercise. Stop. You're literally perfect. I spat out a bitter laugh. Huh. <laughs> Tell that to Arthur. Arthur is an idiot if he can't see how amazing you are. Come on. She offered her arm. Let's walk. I took Jennifer's arm and we started strolling. We lived just two blocks away from each other, both of our penthouses overlooking the same stretch of Central Park. In fact, I was the one who helped Jennifer and her husband secure the lease when the co-op board balked at the size of their bank account. It was huge by any reasonable measure, but it was undersized compared to the other residents in the building. I knew several members of the board from my private school days, so I put in a call to reassure them that Jennifer deserved a spot in the building. She never thanked me. We walked in silence for a minute before I decided to apologize again. That was another thing my mother had taught me. Never allow an apology to go unaccepted. It was bad luck. Jennifer, I am so sorry about what I said earlier. Jennifer waved her hand dismissively. Forget about it. No, seriously. I should have been more sensitive. I know how hard it's been. Honestly, I'm tired of talking about me. Let's talk about you. Tell me about you and Arthur. 
What's the deal? I don't know. I shrugged. I couldn't tell whether she was trying to be supportive or just nosy. Either way, I didn't really feel like going into the details. He's just... It's been like six months. Since? Since, you know... No sex? I shrugged. The fact was, it was worse than just no sex. He didn't even seem to look at me anymore. He was out the door before I woke up and stayed out so late that I often fell asleep on the couch before he made it home. The click of the deadbolt would wake me, a waft of cigarette smoke, brandy, and something floral drifting by me as he walked past and headed up the stairs to bed. Sometimes, he didn't even say goodnight. Jennifer winced and drew in a sharp breath. Yeah, that's not good. I wonder why. He couldn't get enough of me back when we were dating. I used to have to beat him off with a stick. I mean, not beat him off with a stick, but... She laughed at the double entendre. (laughs) You know what I mean. (laughs) Yes, well... I smiled through a clenched jaw. Jennifer never missed the chance to remind me that Arthur had loved her before he loved me. That was a long time ago. Obviously. What do you think his problem is? My eyes fell. It's not him. It's me. I think he's just not attracted to me anymore. I know I've gained some weight, but come on, I'm almost 50. It could be worse, right? So much worse. You think he's cheating? The question hit me like a smack in the face, causing me to flinch. A sense memory of that floral scent intermixed with the more masculine odors from the bar made my eyes water. No, I mean, I'd like to think he wouldn't, but... I abruptly stopped walking, pulling my arm away from Jennifer and covering my face with my hands. A sob escaped from my lips. I knew she was right. He almost certainly was cheating. But hearing Jennifer say it out loud suddenly crystallized the idea in a way that made it more real than it had ever seemed before. Jennifer embraced me in a comforting hug. Come here. She placed her hand on my head, allowing me to cry against her shoulder. Shh, it's okay. I'm sorry. My voice was muffled by the fabric of her dress. Girl, please, you really need to stop apologizing. Sorry. I sputtered a sobbing laugh, then stepped away from Jennifer and wiped my cheeks with my hands. Christ, I'm a mess. I reached into my purse, pulled out a tissue, and dabbed at my eyes. Thank God for waterproof mascara, at least. You know what I think? Jennifer said with a conspiratorial whisper. What? I think you should try second skin. I crumpled up the tissue and dropped it back into my purse. I thought we weren't supposed to know about that. Well, you're not, but... What the hell? Maybe I can get you in. You, you do that for me? I clasped my hands to my chest, genuinely touched by the gesture. Jennifer and I had always had somewhat of a competitive friendship... More frenemies than friends, especially after what happened with Arthur. That definitely made it weird for a while. The awkwardness faded over time, but it left a waxy residue of resentment on our friendship that never seemed to dissolve entirely. For you? Jennifer traced a cool finger down my cheek, catching a runaway tear as it slipped from my eye. Anything. I checked the text message from Jennifer on my iPhone, then peered out the backseat window of the taxi. The address on the building where the cab was idling matched the one in Jennifer's text, but it certainly didn't seem like the location of the most exclusive spot in the city. Graffitied plywood hung over the windows. A long row of homeless people in cardboard boxes and dirty tents lined the sidewalk. A drug addict slumped unconscious in the doorway, a needle still dangling from his arm. This is it. He looked at me in the rearview mirror. You getting out or what? I guess so. I dug a hundred dollar bill out of my purse and handed it to the driver. Keep the change. Thanks. You have a good one. As I opened the door, he added, 
Stay safe out there. This area, it's, uh, it's not great. <laughs> I'll try. I stepped out of the cab and closed the creaking door with a thud. The taxi's tires screeched as it pulled away, leaving me alone at the curb. Jennifer had warned me that the spa was inconveniently located, but she failed to mention it was in the worst neighborhood in the city. She just said to follow her instructions and everything would be fine. With that in mind, I rechecked my phone, then set off down the sidewalk and into the alley on the side of the building. The sound of a power saw screamed from somewhere inside one of the buildings. I passed a dumpster piled high with oversized trash bags stepping over a puddle of unidentifiable brownish-red effluence dripping from one of them. Just beyond the dumpster was a rusted metal door with no handle, exactly as Jennifer had described. As unlikely as it seemed, I was in the right place. I was about to pound on the door when suddenly it swung open, startling me. Oh, sorry, I didn't know... I stopped mid-sentence. There was nobody there. The door had opened on his own. Hello? No answer. I looked down the alley in each direction, then looked up. An expensive-looking surveillance camera was mounted on the wall above the door. I breathed out a nervous laugh. Okay, <laughs> I see, I said to myself. Obviously, someone watching through that camera had opened the door remotely. After a brief hesitation, I stepped through the doorway. As soon as I passed the threshold, the door swung shut behind me with a slam like a gunshot. The sound ricocheted off the cinder block walls of the stairwell. Hello? Again, there was no answer, just the echo of my voice disappearing into the shadows below. Jennifer's instructions said to go down the stairs to the bottom floor, so I used my phone's flashlight to guide my way. I carefully descended several levels before arriving at a door with a glowing green exit sign. Confident I was still on the right track, I pushed through the door and emerged into an empty underground parking garage. Long rows of fluorescent lights flickered on the ceiling, creating an eerie strobe effect that made me feel like I had wandered onto the set of the movie Saw. This is nuts. I considered turning around and heading back up the stairs, but then I realized the exit door had locked behind me. I had no choice but to go on. Jennifer told me to look for a pair of glass doors after I went through the exit. Sure enough, that's exactly what I saw. The rapid clacking of my high heels reverberated through the vast expanse of the garage as I speed walked across the oil-stained concrete to the doors. They were fully papered over with newsprint that had to be at least 25 years old, judging by the image of the twin towers in one of the faded photos. This time, I noticed the surveillance camera over the doors right away, so it didn't surprise me as much when they opened automatically. What did surprise me, however, was what I saw on the other side. Beyond the glass doors was the most breathtakingly grandiose spa I had ever seen. The lavishness was especially shocking compared to the surrounding neighborhood. It was like opening the door to a crack house and finding Versailles inside. Indeed, the decor reminded me of the palace's hall of mirrors. Parquet wood floor, arched ceilings painted with intricate murals, enormous crystal chandeliers, and paneled walls accented with gold leaf trim. In the center of the room, a string quartet played a peaceful rendition of Bach's The Art of Fugue. A stunning brunette in a smart black pantsuit and crisp white blouse ushered me through the doors. Ah, Miss Rosenthal, please she said with a hint of a French accent. Welcome to Second Skin. The door swung shut silently behind me as I entered. My name is Adrienne, and I'll be your host this afternoon. May I? She extended her hand toward my purse. Oh, yes, of course. I handed my Louis Vuitton bag to Adrienne, who quickly passed it to an usher. The man disappeared through a doorway into what I assumed was a coat room. It wasn't until he was gone that I realized I probably should have held on to my phone. But before I could protest, 
another usher appeared with a crystal champagne flute on a silver platter. Champagne, madam? He bowed slightly. I giggled with delight. Wow, you don't waste any time here, do you? I took the glass and sipped the champagne. The taste was exquisite. Mmm, this is delicious. Yes, Louis Roderer, Cristal, 1996. It's quite special. Please. Adrian guided me toward a hallway lined with candelabras. The dancing flames cast a golden glow on the dark wood walls. It was like stepping directly into 17th century France. As I followed Adrian, I noticed a woman in her 60s watching me from across the room. She wore a white robe and slippers, so she was obviously a client of the spa. The woman whispered something to her own concierge, a slim blonde outfitted identically to Adrian. I wasn't exactly a trained lip reader, but it seemed like the woman said, That one? The concierge glanced at me, then whispered something back to the woman. The woman sipped her champagne and nodded approvingly. The moment made me uncomfortable, but I quickly dismissed the feeling. I was used to getting dirty looks from older women, jealous of my relative youth and beauty. Typical Metropolitan Club bullshit. It wasn't the first time, and it wouldn't be the last. Even as I aged, there would always be someone older and uglier who couldn't stand the look of me. It was inevitable. So, I followed her down the hall. How does this work exactly? Is there a menu of services? It's quite simple. I'll escort you to one of our suites, where you'll disrobe, bathe, dine, and relax for as long as you desire. Once you're ready, you'll let me know, and I'll bring you to your first service. And that is... A surprise. Her eyes sparkled with a mischievous gleam in the candlelight. Trust me. It will be an experience you won't soon forget. She arrived at an ornately carved wooden door and pushed it open. Here we are. Your suite. I expected the suite to be little more than a glorified dressing room, so I was shocked to see it was the size of a large apartment. It had a living area with a full buffet of fruit, desserts, charcuterie, pastries, and champagne. Through a pair of French doors was a bedroom with a king-sized bed, a changing area, and a bathroom with a shower big enough to house the string quartet from the lobby. The only thing missing was windows. It seemed the suite was fully underground. That made sense, considering how many flights of stairs I had come down on the way in. I wandered into the suite, sipping my champagne as I admired the impressive accommodations. This is all for me? Indeed. Today is entirely about you. So enjoy. Take your time, and when you're ready, you'll simply press this button to let me know. I turned to see Adrian indicating a gold button on the wall next to the entrance. In the hallway behind her, a woman with fair skin and copper-colored hair walked past the door. The woman quickly glanced into the suite as she passed, then disappeared down the hall. Jennifer? I spoke out loud, but mostly to myself. I had only caught a glimpse of the woman, but it looked a lot like my friend. Jennifer hadn't mentioned she would be at Second Skin. Maybe it was a last-minute thing. Or perhaps she had messaged my phone to tell me. The phone that was in my purse locked away elsewhere in the building. Jennifer! I called louder this time. I moved toward the door, hoping to catch the maybe Jennifer before she entered her own suite. But Adrian blocked my path. No, no. I assure you, Miss Rosenthal, that was not your Jennifer. I tried to peek over Adrian's shoulder into the hall. Are you sure? Most certainly. Come. Adrian placed a hand on my arm and guided me gently but firmly back into the suite, closing the door with her other hand as she did. The sound of a heavy deadbolt thudded inside the wall. Let me show you the bath. 
I dried my hair with a downy soft Egyptian cotton towel, then applied a layer of moisturizer over every inch of my body. The lotion had a delicate citrus scent with a bit of an astringent sting that made it feel and smell absolutely exhilarating. It was incredible how soft the moisturizer made my skin. It felt as flawless and smooth as a newborn baby. As I examined my naked body in the full-length mirror, I actually felt beautiful for the first time in a long time. I wished Arthur was there to see me. Maybe then he'd be interested in me again. Suddenly, Jennifer's words from the other day popped into my head. He couldn't get enough of me back when we were dating. Arthur had dated Jennifer shortly after college, but she broke up with him in favor of a surgeon who eventually became her now-deceased husband. I always wondered whether Arthur still had feelings for Jennifer, or she for him, frankly. I couldn't help but feel competitive. After all, Jennifer was taller, thinner, prettier. I could hardly fault Arthur if he was more interested in her than his own wife. Stop it, I thought. Arthur is yours. He loves you. You won. After taking a few deep breaths to restore my sense of calm, I donned a thick white robe and wandered into the living room to peruse the buffet. I indulged in a few chocolate-covered strawberries, then helped myself to another glass of champagne. I had always been a lightweight when it came to alcohol, but something about the champagne made me feel way tipsier than I expected. By the time I finished my second glass, I was already heavily buzzed. Satisfied with my snack, I crossed the snow-white carpet and pressed the golden button on the wall by the door. A pleasant chime sounded, which I assumed would inform Adrian that I was ready for whatever came next. I was excited about the surprise service the concierge had teased. Would it be an eight-handed massage? A white caviar facial? A volcanic mud bath? I could only imagine what kinds of unique luxuries a place like Second Skin had to offer. I picked up a third glass of champagne from the buffet and then reclined on a chaise lounge to relax while I waited for Adrian to return. As if by magic, the lights dimmed and an ambient soundscape of Tibetan singing bowls and chirping birds began to emanate from hidden speakers. The air filled with a fragrant aromatherapy mist. I felt my eyelids grow heavy. The combination of the alcohol, the bath, and the relaxing ambiance was making me incredibly sleepy. As I drifted off, the crystal champagne glass slipped from my fingers onto the floor. I'm naked, I thought as I emerged from the deepest sleep I had ever experienced. Why am I naked? For a moment, I had no idea where I was. My brain felt like it had been dipped in glue and rolled in cotton. Then I remembered I was at Versailles. No, not Versailles. The spa. Second skin. The one that Jennifer had gotten me into. The one she wasn't even allowed to talk about. Is this Fight Club? I smiled deliriously at the thought. I was pretty sure Fight Club didn't serve thousand dollar bottles of champagne. And besides, Brad Pitt was nowhere to be found. My eyelids fluttered as I struggled to remain conscious. When my vision cleared, I found myself staring up at the ceiling of what appeared to be an operating room. A brilliant white light was positioned directly over my face, blinding me. I lifted my head to look at my body and saw that I was indeed naked, spread eagled on a star-shaped table with padded restraints around my wrists and ankles. Odd markings were drawn on my skin with black sharpie, tracing dotted lines along the sides of my limbs, around my wrists and ankles, and down the center of my torso from my neck to my groin. Tiny numbers were written with the same sharpie at various places around my body. Just relax. A woman's voice intoned. We'll be getting started in a minute. I groggily rolled my head toward the voice. It was the concierge, Adrian. But why were her hands blue? No, her hands weren't blue. She was wearing gloves. Surgical gloves. 
A tray lined with gleaming surgical implements was positioned beside her. It had scalpels, scissors, a bone saw. Adrian tapped her finger against a large syringe, squirted a stream of clear liquid into the air, and wiped my arm with an alcohol-soaked cotton ball. Hey, what are you doing? I'm just giving you a little something to help you relax until the doctor is ready. Doctor? Why, of course. You wouldn't want anyone else to do this procedure, would you? Adrian smiled brightly as she inserted the needle into my arm. I sure wouldn't. Behind Adrian, a door opened and three people entered the operating room. The older woman who had been eyeing me when I entered the spa, the woman's blonde concierge, and a third woman who reminded me of the seamstress who had fitted me for my wedding dress. I wondered why I had made that connection, then realized it was because of the red measuring tape draped around the woman's neck. The three women walked into a room adjacent to the operating room. The older woman removed her robe, leaving herself completely naked. I watched as the seamstress began taking the woman's measurements. The length of her arms and legs, the circumference of her chest, waist, and hips, the sort of measurements typical of a dress fitting. But then she did something I had never seen before. She began to measure the woman's head, her neck, her face. With each measurement, she recited the values to the blonde concierge who wrote the numbers on a clipboard. When the seamstress was done measuring the older woman, she returned to the operating room with the clipboard. She circled my body, examining the dotted lines and tiny numbers while jotting additional notes on the clipboard. In various places, she pinched my skin, stretching it as if to test its elasticity. It should have been painful, but I couldn't feel a thing. It was like I was watching the seamstress from inside a glass bubble, like the body she was poking and prodding belonged to someone else. I tried to speak, to ask what she was doing, but my tongue felt thick and useless in my mouth. A wave of dizziness overcame me. As I struggled to maintain consciousness, I saw the seamstress examine the numbers on her clipboard one last time, comparing the measurements from the older woman's body to my own. Looks like Jennifer was right. The seamstress said to Adrian with a smile. Should be a perfect fit. I hope you enjoyed A Perfect Fit, as written by Warren Benedetto and performed by Justine Anastasia, Danielle Hewitt, Michelle Kane, Olivia Steele, Steve Gray, and Rissa Montanez. Justine Anastasia was raised in the Northeast, an area that ghosts have called home for centuries. As a small child, her mother would tuck her in with bedtime stories that featured children kept in basements and in human babies. You can find more of Danielle Hewitt, Michelle Kane, and Rissa Montanez over on the Creepy Podcast at www.creepypod.com. On to the shows. Longtime resident Otis Gyre has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. And don't forget to check out the Fear from the Heartland archives, featuring more than 120 episodes. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, 
to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. See you next Monday. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.